Um, I've known Scott for over 10 years. I met him backstage at a Get Motivated con conference. I was actually invited to be part of the prayer team. I'm not going to steal his story, but uh, it, was, it was quite an emotional uh, event. I pulled him aside, and I prayed with him. And here it is 12 years later. He's now uh, giving, giving us a great message about his walk and, and his talk. He's a man of integrity, um, and he's spoken to tens of thousands of people, uh, inspiring them, and he was never afraid to share his faith. So we're glad to have Scott. Give Scott Schilling a, a round of applause, and we appreciate you for coming here. Thank you, Ken. Love you, man. Okay, are we up and running? How are we doing today? Great. Is it okay if we start with my pre-event prayer? I'm going to do it anyway. Lord, allow the words that I share here today to positively impact 100% of the lives in this audience in one way, shape, or form. Only you know who you sent here to hear this message. Allow me to do the best I can to deliver that message via vehicle and of service to you. See, that's all I can ever control when I come up here is having a high intention and a low attachment, a high intention of imparting something great for each and every one of you here today and a low attachment as to what that means for either you or for me, quite frankly. I want to start out by thanking you all, because on my three-hour drive this morning, I had three hours of praise and worship. It was so awesome to go through the channels, coming down 35, and going from channel to channel to channel. And what was wild is the, the songs... Like we're just run one right after another. It was like, wow, how did that happen? That's pretty bizarre, right? So I'm going to put 25 years into 40 minutes. Is that okay? It's going to go pretty quick. Hold on. You might light on fire. It could be spontaneous combustion here as we go along. So where do I start? I start as a 17-year-old just a few years ago. Some of you aren't good at math. Okay, the, the fact is, I read a book called See You at the Top by the great Zig Ziglar. And uh, this is a picture of Zig and I at a lunch we had together with a hostage exchange. His last book, my first book, we signed to each other. But at that lunch, I got to ask Zig, where did you create this quote? You can have everything in life you want when you help enough other people get what they want. Zig leaned in and he goes, Scott... I didn't create that quote. My mama taught me that when I was five. It was part of my christening when I was 12. I said, Zig, can I share that story? He said, I'd be honored. See, there are times when people touch you that things happen in your life that forever change you. It set a course for my entire life. Now, my dad worked for the same company for 46 years. So when I went to college... I went into corporate America. Why? Because that's what I saw modeled. And I was there, and I rose to the top, and that was cool, about 12 years. And shocker, corporate America changed. And they asked me to do something that they had every right to ask me to do, and every right that I had the right to say no to. But I didn't have the right to stay working there. So I said, no. They said, we need you to reduce the head count out here. And they wanted me to take out a black female mother of two, single mother, going to night school to save $20,000. And I said, no. And they said, get on an airplane and come up and talk to us. So I flew up there and I got yelled at for three days. Has anybody ever had that fun? You know, you're the boss, and us, and you get yelled at for three days. And they said, you have until Friday to give us a head count. I said, okay, I hear you. I got home the next day. A guy said, hey, I'm looking for a vice president of sales and marketing. I know it's not you because you're kicking our butt. But I said, wait a second. You want to have lunch? He said, sure. So we had lunch. And by that afternoon, I had a 35% raise, a new car. And on Friday, I called the company. I said, I got your head count. They said, did you get rid of her? I said, nope, I got rid of me. I quit. See, there are times in life where God gives you a nudge. Whew. Should have had the over and under on when I was going to cry. Uh, you know, there are times in life where you got to make decisions. 
and you do that. Well, so I came up with a mission statement. My mission is multifaceted, to build a community of a million or more, maximizing them spiritually, personally, professionally, financially, creating enough influence in the world to cause over $100 million in charitable giving and to positively impact a billion or more lives on the planet. I was doing a radio show one day. A guy said, who do you think you are? And I said, me? And he said, well, you think you can positively impact a billion lives on the planet? And I said, well, Zuckerberg does, and I'm better than him. And he goes, well, that's kind of rude. And I said, I think you telling me I can't do it is kind of rude. And he goes, you really believe you can touch a billion or more lives? I said, absolutely. And he goes, so how are you doing it? Every way I can. And he said, you really think this is going to happen, don't you? I said, no, I know it's going to happen. But, but let's say I'm not good at this, and I hit 100 million. Would that be okay? What if I'm bad at it, and I hit 10 million? What if I'm not good at all, and I only touch a million lives? Would that be okay? He said, you're serious. I said, God doesn't put anything on your heart that he doesn't equip you to complete. He put this on my heart. I didn't make this up. This was what God put on my heart. This is called walking out God's plan. Does anybody know God's plan for your life? I mean, you, you sat, you talked to him one night, and you said, God, what do you got for me? And I'm just going to write it out, and it's the way it's going to be. Crickets? No. Yeah, me either. And so what you do is every time God puts an impression on your heart, you take a step. Now, some of those steps end up in not pleasant situations. And I'm going to describe some of them. So anyway, that was my thing. Well, I said, if I'm going to do that, how can I do that? I need to go start speaking. Well, I had a friend who was the president of Parker College at the time, now Parker University, chiropractic college. I said, I want to, oh, trust me, I've spoken in the industry for 25 years. I, I love chiropractic. I am a chiropractic advocate. Anyway, so there are 14, 1,380 students there. And I started talking and sharing messages and doing anything I could to impart goodness. God allowed me to do this, sometimes even well. So the, the point is that the friend was also running Parker seminars. And I said, if there's ever a time, I said, I want to make the move to be a professional speaker. That means you get paid to speak, okay? Not just a speaker a professional speaker. And so I said, if there's ever a time where you have an opportunity for me to come speak, I'm in. So we let it set. And all of a sudden, about the second week of July one year, I get a call and he says, were you serious about speaking on our stages? And I said, absolutely. He said, well, I had not just one speaker cancel, I had two. I will not only give you one speaking spot, I will give you two speaking spots, and I will pay you for both. I said, I am in. He said, you didn't ask where it was. I said, I don't care. He said, it's in Toronto. I said, wonderful. I would love to go to Toronto. He said, it's the middle of the SARS epidemic. And I said, what's that? He said, 8,000 people have died. That's why two speakers have canceled. They're afraid to get SARS. And I said, well, I can either die of SARS or die on stage. We're going. And I went. I took the step that God opened up. Well, the headliners for that event were Jack Canfield and Mark Victor Hansen the creators of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. Only sold 600 million books at this point. They're a little bit slacker, but good friends of mine now. Well, as it turned out, they walked into not one of my presentations, but both. And after my second presentation, 
They walked straight up to me, thumped me in the sternum. Anybody ever do that to you? It hurts. I mean, they thumped me hard. And they said, son, I love telling this story because Jack Canfield called me son. Son, are you doing this professionally? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, this is my first paid event, and I'm considering doing it full time. And he said, why aren't you doing it full time? And I said, because I have a job. And Mark Victor Hansen looked at me and said, that's the most ridiculous answer I have ever heard in my life. And I said, what? I have a job is a ridiculous answer? And they teamed up on me. And they said, God has granted you talents and capabilities most people don't have. And if you don't utilize those talents as much as you can, you're robbing humanity. You're cheating humanity. In fact, you're being selfish. Dang, I just met these guys. I mean, that was pretty heavy, right? And then they took me aside and they talked to me. And they said, God's got plans for you. I said, what are they? They said, how do we know? <laughs> but he's given you talents and capabilities most people don't have. Go use them. I flew back and I quit. I quit my job. President of the company said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going off speaking professionally. I'm going to speak. I'm going to train. I'm going to coach. He goes, do you have any clients? I go, nope. He goes, do you have anything set up? I said, nope. He said, you're never going to make it. I said, that's your opinion. Well, I've done 3,000 live events in my career. I've done okay. Somebody said, are you any good? You don't get asked back if you're not. It doesn't work that way. Anyway, so I ended up being able to be on stages like that. I mean, there's only like 25 or 7,000 people there. It's pretty cool. It's about the same size, about the same group here, right? But you're in there and you're, you're talking and you get this opportunity. People say, how did you get the opportunity to do that? You want to know the story? So 10 years earlier, there was a chiropractic event in Dallas. They expected 250 people. There were 750. I was one of the speakers. Afterwards, I walked up to the promoter and I said, You've got way too many people to process, not enough people to do it. How about if I work the back table the rest of the weekend and I help you? And he said, we can't pay you. I said, when did I ever ask to be paid? You need help. I'm here to serve. We had an amazing weekend the rest of the weekend. Five years later, I'm at the Marina Hotel in Sarasota, Florida, and he comes walking in the room. I go, hey, Rick, how you doing? He goes, you remember me? I said, we did that event at the Hotel Intercontinental in Dallas five years ago. You had a, ran out of people. I worked the back table for you. He goes, yeah, you're right. I was selling a $4,000 product that day. He bought it. Five years later, he was responsible for putting everybody on those stages. The owner the president, and he sat down and asked one question. Who's the best speaker in the country who's not speaking on our stages right now? All wrote a name on a piece of paper, put it on the table, prayed over it, opened up, and mine was all three names. And they called me and said, God says you're supposed to be speaking at Get Motivated. I said, yes, sir, when do you want me? And that's how I got to Get Motivated. I was a 10-year overnight sensation. God's plan and timing is perfect, but it is not our timing. And if it takes 10 years, it takes 10 years. And if it takes 50 years, it takes 50 years. I was with my spiritual guide, one of my, I'll tell her that story here in a second. I got so many stories. I got, we need a day stretcher here. So anyway, 
I thought, wow, I have this amazing opportunity to speak at Get Motivated State uh, seminars in front of thousands and thousands of people. This is going to be so cool and, and, and make bank, make money, and do all this kind of cool stuff. Well, you know, we got a prayer room underneath the arenas. What? Oh, yeah, before you speak, if you want, you can go to the prayer room. What? Well, yeah, there's a bunch of prayer room, room uh, there's a bunch of prayer warriors from the local city that will pray over you if you want. I've never had that. This would be cool. Well, we happened to be in a strange, weird town called Austin. And we were at the Austin Convention Center. And so I'm getting ready to go on stage, and I'm like, Oh, no, I'm going to go get prayed over. I've never been prayed over before. And so I go to the prayer room, and, and, and man, there's 25 prayer warriors. And, man, they start praying. And they are serious about their praying. I'm just telling you. They, they are praying, right? And so I'm like, well, how? I, I just hope I don't mess myself going out there. I'm so excited. This is, like, so crazy. And all of a sudden, I'm walking out, getting ready to go, and there's this guy that stands up and says, Scott, Scott, my name, he didn't say his name, his name might have been Ken Renner. And he said, God, just put a verse on my heart for you. Can I share it with you? I said, wow, nobody's ever done that for me before. What is it? Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord's plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope in a future. Oh, thank you. And we prayed more and became friends. And you think the story in there, not even close. So the next month we're in Ontario, California. Big arena, another prayer group, Pentecostals. I mean, they were prayers. I mean, wow, they were, they were on fire prayers. They were like crazy prayers. And, and so I go in just before and I get prayed over. And whew, I'm feeling so good. And I get up and somebody goes, Scott, Scott, Scott. God just put a verse in my heart for you. Can I share it with you? Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord's plans to prosper you, not to harm you, give you hope in a future. Freaky. <laughs> what is happening? Right? Next month, we're at the Thomas and Mack Center in Las Vegas. And pretty good praying group out in Las Vegas. They need it. So they were praying pretty hard. And, and all of a sudden, this female pastor stands up and says, Scott, Scott, God put a verse on my heart for you. I said, let me prophesy. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, give you hope in the future. She goes, how'd you know? So you don't think God has a plan for you? They called that a clue. I mean, three months, three different groups, three different things. How do I deserve this? This is like really wild, right? So I go on and I'm speaking at uh, uh, Success Resources. 10,000 people in the round in Denver, their first event like this. Now, if you're in the round, you've got two cheater screens there, two there, two there, two there, right? And I said, the only way I'll do this presentation is God has put a presentation on my heart the trilogy of success, faith, family, and focus. You want me to sell a financial product, I'll make it faith, family, finance. They said, okay. So 22 minutes of what I wanted to do, 38 minutes of what they wanted me to do in front of 10,000 people. So I get up there and I do faith. <laughs> Man, I'm cooking it. And I do family. Well, it should be good. I love them. They're my kids, right? My, my wife. And I go to click to go do finance, and my screens are black. And I click, and my screens stay black. And for the next 38 minutes in front of 10,000 people, I got to say stuff. I have no choice. And I've got to be as compliant as I can with a presentation I don't really know. So I'm ham and egging it. And all of a sudden, I say, well, that's it. I'm going to have a conversation with God. Because when you do enough of this, you can do multiple things at the same time. Like I could be ordering food right now. You wouldn't even know it. But the fact is, so uh, I start having a conversation with God. God, 
why are you doing this to me? I didn't want this gig in the first place. You gave it to me. I am now being publicly humiliated. You are ending my career in front of 10,000 people. What the hey? And I'm talking to the audience at the same time. Well, I send them to the tables, and as soon as they shut down my mic, I go, God, that is it! I'm done being a hired gun, except for three things. Sharing messages of hope and inspiration, teaching and training others to do the same, and building you kingdom. Do you hear me? I am done! And the audience is cheering. Well, they think I'm excited about the presentation. I'm yelling at God! By the way, side note, not a good idea. I am in a full-blown argument with God. Now I've got to come through the audience. They're high-fiving me. That was awesome. We love your energy. Oh, you're amazing. Oh, this is great. Oh, I'm like, my career's over. I, this is terrible. What am I doing? Anyway, so this lady who spoke earlier in the day was backstage, and uh, she goes, that was amazing. I said, so, I don't know what you saw. My career is over. And she goes, you were great. I said, no, I'm done. See, I didn't have a credit card that worked. I was beyond broke. I had $7.48 in my pocket. It's the only reason I took the gig. They said I was going to make $25,000 event, three events a month. Would you take the gig? My wife likes to eat three times a day. So anyway, so I say yes. Well, I am so dejected. My career is definitely over. I know that to be true. And so, basically, I go back to the hotel, put on jeans, and I am going to Jimmy John's for an unwitch because it's $5.49. I got $7.48. I am wealthy. I am walking out, and all of a sudden do this, and go straight left to the table where the woman, her assistant, Lance Wall now, and his wife, Annabelle, we're at the table. Lance did the gospel there that day. And I walked up to her, and she looked up, and she said, Oh, hi, please join us. I said, No, ma'am, I think I walked over here to apologize because I was really rude. That, that's not who I am. She goes, Please, sit down and join us. I said, No, ma'am, I'm going to Jimmy John's for an unwitch. She goes, Sit. I said, Yes, ma'am. She goes, Give me your hand. Lance, take his hand. Everybody bow. Now, she was the bishop of 42 Pentecostal churches. You think I thought praying before was something? She was praying. And there wasn't a single word I knew. And I mean, she was praying, and she was praying hard. And she said, okay, so it's settled. I said, excuse me? She said, you're going to dinner with us. I said, no, ma'am, I'm going to Jimmy John's. She said, you're going to dinner. I said, no, ma'am. She goes, you're going to dinner. I said, yes, ma'am. So we go to Unsinkable Molly Brown's, downtown Denver. I'm reading the right side. I don't even know what I ordered. I was just looking for the lowest number possible. They didn't have anything for seven bucks. But I picked whatever was the lowest, okay? They're talking the entire meal about me. And I'm sitting right there. And at one point I said, I'm sitting right here. And they said, we know, be quiet. <laughs> I said, okay. She goes, Lance, are you getting what I'm getting? He goes, absolutely. She goes, okay, it's settled again. It's settled again, again. What are we doing now? She said, we are going to go back to the hotel. There will be a room open. We are going to put a chair in the middle of the room. We are going to get on four corners of you. We're going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. You don't know what that is, but you will by the end of the night. I said, yes, ma'am. And then the bills came. Remember, I didn't have a credit card that worked $7.48 in my pocket. So they gave me my bill, and I threw out a credit card that I knew did not work because I was going to go, oh, how did that happen? <laughs> and hope that somebody would pick up my bill. And the waitress came back and went, here you go, sir. It went through. It can't go through. Take this back. It can't go through. It's not possible for this to go through. It went through. 
So imagine this, a 72-year-old woman walking in with Lance Walnow and I and her assistant and, and Lance's wife, walking up to the front desk at the downtown Marriott in Denver and saying, I need a room for only about an hour. What room is available? When I think back, quite a funny situation. The girl says, Cheyenne room, top of the stairs, second floor. Let yourself in. It's a meeting room. And they sat down in a chair. They were on all four corners of me, laid hands on me, baptized me in the Holy Spirit. And I looked at her, and I said, why me? She said, because of your declaration. What are you talking about? Your declaration to God. I'm done being a hired gun except for three things. Sharing messages of hope and inspiration. Teaching and training others to do the same. And building his kingdom. He heard you. He believed you. He's never going to let you out of it. Hold on. Your life will never be the same. The biggest understatement Ever. I'm just telling you. So that led to this. And that's only a partial. I've gotten to know some pretty cool people and share the stage with them. Every name you know. You might not know mine. That wasn't my task at the time. But I got to hang with some really cool people. And what you find is they're amazing people, very godly people. Very, they, they understand that it's not them. You get it? They understand it's him. And so then I got to go to Singapore. Well, that was pretty cool. And we're out there. And I don't know much about Singapore other than it's a beautiful place. And I go there. And that's actually where I created my pre-event prayer. Because I looked at the audience and they did not look like me. Right? I'm looking at this whole group of thousands and thousands of people who were not me. I mean, great people. Don't get me wrong. But it was like, whew, I need some strength. So I created that pre-event prayer. And I created it backstage, and I said it. And I went on stage, and I went, okay, let's start with my pre-event prayer. Lord, allow the words I share here today to positively impact 100% of the lives in this audience, one way, shape, or form. Only you know who you sent here to hear this message. Allow me to do the best I can to deliver that message, be a vehicle in service to you. See, it's not my job to get you to believe what I believe. But it is my job to get you to believe and whatever you are, represent your beliefs to the fullest. I am a living example of my God, Christ, Jesus Christ. And so I am not afraid to start this way here. And then I went into my talk. I had never done that in my life. It's like, what did it, right? So I finished speaking. And there's four Muslim women down at the bottom of the stage waiting for me. I'm like, that's weird. Mr. Scott, can we get our picture made with you? Well, sure. But hear my heart. I don't purport to understand your customs. But I didn't think you took pictures with people. And they said, we don't. We only take pictures with people or things that we want to honor. I said, well, that's unique. Why would you want to honor me? And they said, because you made us cry. I said, okay, I am really confused. You want to honor me because I made you cry? And they said, for the first time in our life, you didn't try to convert us. And for that, we honor you. You encouraged us to have faith. You met us where we were so we could hear where you wanted us to go. We honor you. Now, God equipped me with that story. I've told it from stage so many times. What if those women, God forbid, that were married to the worst terrorist in Southeast Asia. And what if because of that, they said there's one Westerner, one Christian, not so bad. And what if because of that, some heinous act was either lessened or not done at all? Now, I got no way to prove it, no way to disprove it. What if we were all just the living example God has asked us to be? What if we just walked like Jesus? What if we treated everybody with respect, honor, and dignity for what they deserve. That's the way it is. It's the way it should be. So then, 
you know, I get, I've been the front man of eight infomercials. That's why everybody looks at me and goes, you look familiar. I got no clue who you are. Thanks. Appreciate it. If it was Flex Seal, you'd know me. It wasn't. Anyway, so here we are filming an infomercial shoot one day in, in L.A. and having a great time. We've got an audience. And the next day we decide we're going to go to uh, Matthew Barnett's Angelus Temple for service. And then Matthew invited us to go to see the Dream Center. Now, there's a few people in the room that remember the TV show Emergency 51. Remember when they used to say, hey, we're coming into Rampart, the hospital? Well, the church bought Rampart Hospital, turned it into a thing. They had 734 pimps, whores, drug addicts, you name it, in a one-year discipleship program that all lived in that building. And basically for the service, they were all up there. And it was an amazing service. And so we were up on the Dream Center and overlooking the Hollywood Hills from Watts. Remember Watts used to be a really bad area? You look down, it was clean and perfect. The disciples had done that. They wanted their neighborhood to be godlike. Well, then we took this picture, that's me, and we decided to go to Bubba Gump's for lunch at Universal City Walk. We, ate, we hadn't eaten yet. Now, I hadn't been feeling great all morning, but I didn't know what was going on. Well, we got off a shuttle, and I was walking, and my legs stopped. And I was standing on two tingling stumps from just above the knee down. And all of a sudden, I started becoming disoriented. And fortunately, there was a railing behind me. I started to fall back. One of the seven people I was walking with slid a chair underneath me. I slid in the chair, walking with seven people, three of them doctors. Coincidence? I think not. And all of a sudden, I had a full-blown cerebellar stroke. The posterior interior cerebellar artery let go, and basically, I was in a full-blown near-death experience, to which they then took me to the emergency room, and after five hours, they misdiagnosed me with a major migraine and released me, to which I got back to my hotel room. Now, they were, fin they were filming the final night of Survivor. The Survivor cast was down in the lobby. Leonard Skinner was down in the lobby, and everybody's like, you don't want to hang with Leonard Skinner? I go, my head's about to blow off because they misdiagnosed this. I go up to the room. The pain is so intense, I call out, God, help! And I heard an audible, drop to your knees. And I dropped to my knees. Had my elbows on the bed. I said, Lord, I've been teaching your plan and timing is perfect for the last couple of years now. I do not pretend to understand this plan or this timing. I do not believe your plan is to call me home. And I do not believe your plan is to maim me or disable me. So I'm choosing to believe your plan is to wake me up. Duly noted, you got my attention. And I'm supposed to use this event to serve and save myself and others physically and spiritually for the rest of my life. And if that, in fact, is your will for my life, I ask for your wisdom and guidance going forward so I implement that appropriately. And if that's not your will for my life, I want you to know whatever you got for me, I'm good with. I went to climb into bed, but I didn't climb into bed. I climbed on a cloud. Total peace. Never felt it before. Have never felt it since. Got up the next day, went on set, Shot three infomercial segments, 56 minutes, 18 minutes, 14 minutes. Went to another neurologist. He did an MRI. His fir first words are, get your butt to the emergency room. Check into ICU. You've had a stroke. And I sat for six days in intensive care with the doctors going, we have no idea how you are alive. Now, when you hear that repeatedly, it works on you a little bit. And so after the fourth day, I said, sorry to disappoint you. I've always been an overachiever. I lived. And they said, yeah, but we don't understand why. We've got two other stroke patients on the floor. Their MRI is nothing near yours. They're 
totally incapacitated, probably won't make it. You're in here laughing, joking, goofing off with us. We don't understand it. I said, I got it all figured out. And they said, okay, what is it? I said, it's obvious. It's God's grace, mercy, and favor on my life. They said, that's as good an answer as we got, and they discharged me. I'm serious. See, the reality is things happen in life that we don't understand. And I sat, and I was seeking and searching after this. God saved me. There's not a doubt. What do you got for me? What do you got for me? Anybody ever ask, what do you got for me, and heard crickets? I heard flocks of crickets. I heard nothing. And then I said, well, I'm supposed to write a book about this. And, and I didn't know what the title was supposed to be. And I was talking to a friend one day. He said, you've been through so much stuff in your life. You've lived through all of it. What did you say to yourself? I said, that sucks. What now? He goes, what a great title. <laughs> See, because it's not a negative title. That sucks. I wish it wouldn't have happened that way. What now? Let's go through it and let's, let's make something happen. So it's the solutions that I came out with. Page 72, there's a guy named Ken Renner on there in the story of Get Motivated. Why? Because I want everybody to have access to this information. Bob Bodine, talking to the man who wrote The Power of Who in, in Two Chairs. You know, I, I had breakfast with Bob one day, and I said, I gave him a piece. And he goes, you don't listen to your own coaching. You're so amazing. And I, and I said, what are you talking about? He said, you just gave me the answer how you fix somebody else coaching them. Have you ever asked God that same question? I said, okay, God, what would make the easiest decision to put me into your service for the rest of eternity? He said, read my book. Bob says, I'll play God. Read my book. I said, but, but I watch Joyce Meyer every morning. He said, read my book. I, I said, I even watch Joel on the weekends. He said, read my book. He said, I said, Bob, what are you saying to me? He said, read the book. The book has got the answers. You don't have to be a great theologian to understand everything. What this book is, is the equation to total peace. You want the equation to total peace? Ready? God's plan and timing is perfect, plus all things work together for my good equals total peace. You, can't, you don't understand the plan. You can't understand the plan. But when you put it with all things work for your good, it's like, okay, he did it because he did it. I, cool. I'm good. Total peace. All of a sudden, it takes the pressure out of it. Why is all this crud going on around the world? God's plan and timing is perfect. All things work for our good. Okay, let's be at peace. Now, I know it's not easy. I'm not suggesting it is. Well, then, I was asked to take that story and put it into a book with 22 other authors on near death, live. I only died once. There's one guy that died five times in this book. I mean, he's an overachiever. There's... There's a, a, a mother of four that went from being addicted to hero, heroin to becoming a heroin to her kids and no more. So there are, there are rehab stories. There are, that's an, it's an amazing book. I'd like to say my story's awesome. There are awesomer stories in that book. There's 23 of them. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. And, and I got to tell you, I wrote both those books, and I thought, God, this, yeah, I'm on your plan. I'm doing it. And they both launched basically in the pandemic to a grand thud. And you go, God, I'm doing your work. I don't get this. I mean, I'm working to be faithful. I'm working to do what I hear. I'm, I'm talking. I'm asking. I'm listening. I feel like I'm following. And he said, wrong book. He said, now it's time for what you really do. Endless connections creating authentic relationships that matter. It's all about putting people back together again. We've got to get people talking. What Satan did during the pandemic has got everybody to stop speaking to each other. There isn't a single problem, a single disagreement, a single anything that can be solved without speaking. And that book will be out in the next number of days. So, a little shamelessly, I have two of the books are here. You can buy the third one. You can support. This is a movement. It's putting the generations back together. 
We've got to get people talking again with respect, honor, and dignity. Respect is how I treat you. Honor is how I lift you up. And when that happens between us, dignity is created. That's what that book is about. It's a movement to put the generations together, the ethnicities together. We all bleed the same. Doesn't matter whether we're white, green, purple, yellow, male, female, whatever. The fact is, we are all the same in this spiritual experience in a human body. It's time for us to come together. That's what that book is about, is putting the world back together. God has, I thought I had a big mission prior to this. Heck, it was nothing. He said, only a billion people? I want you to positively 8.5 billion. He goes, I want you to touch everybody on the planet. Now, I can't do that alone. I need warriors in the movement because we need to touch people to help lift them up. Does that make sense? I know I'm right at my time. So I'm going to finish with Zig. Godly man, amazing man. We finished that lunch, and Zig and his Zig style leaned in, and he said, Scott, can I share something with you? And I said, Zig, please do. He said, if you're ever discouraged or lack the encouragement you need, always know, at least at one point, even Moses was a basket case. I said, Zig, you still got it. He said, I always will. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. God bless you. If I can ever serve you in any way, please reach out. I'm very serious. Would I love for you to support the books and everything? Absolutely. Why? Because it's not about me. It's about making this a movement and moving forward. Thank you for who you are, what you're doing. God bless.